Last week in Acts, we read the story of Stephen and how at his death, a young Saul looked down and approved. Today, we have skipped over quite a few chapters in Acts, and we've skipped the part where Saul has a conversion experience and becomes Paul. And today, we find Paul in Athens spreading the gospel. He's been preaching and causing a bit of a stir, and he's brought to the Areopagus, which is a place for religious debate. He's brought there to defend himself and what he's been preaching. This is possibly my favorite speech of Paul's. Um, Some of them can get a little heated, and some are a little too confusing to follow, frankly. But this one I find to be particularly beautiful. Let's listen now for the word of God from Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. If you're following along in your pew Bible, you can find that on page 137 in the New Testament. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, this one who is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is God served by human hands as though God needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, God made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and God allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and grope for her and find God. Though indeed God is not far off from each one of us. For in God we live and move and have our being, even as some of your own poets have said. For we too are God's offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by art, an imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now the Lord commands all people everywhere to repent because God has fixed a day on which God will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom God has appointed. And of this, God has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts are acceptable to you in this time. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This year for spring break, our family stayed at home. But during the week, we went downtown to the Adler Planetarium in Chicago for a little bit of a fun adventure. And there were a lot of really cool displays about the planets and the solar systems. And we saw a show about the night sky over Chicago. But there was one part of the exhibit that caught my eye that I wanted to share with you. It's something that I already knew, but it's still something that's utterly fascinating to me. Dark matter. I took some photos, and I'm going to read the text for you if you can't see it. I spy with my little eye not much of the universe at all. Based on what we have learned from our observations, we now know that we can see and interact with only 4% of the universe. The colored gumballs in the jar represent the planets, stars, and galaxies, and other matter that we can see in the universe. The black gumballs represent matter that we know is there, 
but we can't see, called dark matter. Dark matter does not reflect or transmit light, so we cannot see it. How do we know it's there? Because of gravity. There are places in the universe where things move like there is extra gravity pulling on them. Gravity is related to mass, so scientists think that this is caused by extra mass that we cannot see. The extra mass is called dark matter. All of that's from pictures I took of the display. Here's a quote from Saul Permutter, an astrophysicist and a Nobel Prize winner. The universe is made mostly of dark matter and dark energy, and we don't know what either of them is. Basically, there is something that is absolutely massive in our universe, something at play with how the universe and our world and exists, but we don't know what it is or how it works. We give it the name dark matter because that's the best that we can do. An enormous amount of the universe is unknown to us. This whole display reminds me of the people that Paul meets in Athens. Another time when we read this scripture, we can talk about how as Christians we might mirror Paul, how we can share our faith and ways with others, um, using common vocabulary and thinking about how we can effectively share the gospel and be welcoming, but today, Maybe because the dark matter display has been stuck in my head for two months now and I keep going back to these pictures and going, 4%? Or maybe because it's the Holy Spirit. But today we're going to talk about the Athenians. People from Athens took education and philosophy and religion and debate very seriously. Verse 21 of Acts chapter 17, so right before we started reading today, says, Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. They loved learning and hearing new things and discussing them. Athenians had a deep and serious pursuit for many things, and their faith was included. When Paul is in Athens, he sees all of this pursuit. He sees the altars and the temples and the many pagan gods. There were 12 main deities, but also then all of the demigods of Greece. And even though for most of his life, Paul was an exemplary Jew, someone who believed in one god, Paul saw all of this devotion as a quest from the people of Athens to find spiritual fulfillment. They were constantly going from temple to temple, from teacher to teacher, from philosopher to philosopher, learning and listening and making offerings. They were trying to figure out the meaning of life and their role in it. They wanted to understand the universe and how to be people in it. And in this spiritual quest, somewhere in the middle, we don't know where, the Athenians make an altar to the unknown God. Now, perhaps the people of Athens had this altar kind of like a backup plan, like a just-in-case scenario, in case they missed one of the gods and they didn't want to make anybody angry. But more likely, Paul recognizes this altar to the unknown God as a reflection, a physical manifestation that the people of Athens are still searching. In the words of you two, they still haven't found what they're looking for. They are still longing for their spiritual fulfillment. Despite all their temples and their huge hierarchy of gods and demigods, the Athenians are left feeling still a little empty. 
They know there is something more. It's out there. They know it's there. They can tell. They can feel it. But they don't know what it is or how it works. So they do the best that they can. And they name this thing, this feeling, the unknown God. Like the best educated, Nobel Prize winning astrophysicists who know there is something out there. They can feel it. But the best we can do is call it dark matter. Friends, we know this pursuit, this quest for spiritual fulfillment in our lives. People tell me all the time about the churches they visit while church shopping, trying to find the right fit with the right music, with the right amount of people, with the right welcome, with the right theology, with the right pastor, with the right parking. Not just so that they can find the right church, but so they can feel connected to God. And then there are other folks who talk about how they grew up in a very different church from the one they currently attend, or how they grew up in a house or a community that understood God very differently than they do in the current day. And often these folks share about the pain that they go through when they started asking too many questions. They talk about having to leave that community. And even though it wasn't perfect and they knew it was time to go, how it left them feeling a little empty. Still, uh, there are others who are cradle Presbyterians who have been in a familiar pew their whole life and everything's going like it should be, but they still have seasons where they have felt so far from God and they can't quite explain why. And then there's everybody else. The people who talk to me about the things that they're doing to try and find fulfillment in their life. There are the hikers and the bikers and the crossfitters and the yogis. There are the self-help book people and the astrologists and the life coaches and the people who religiously follow a five-minute journal. There are people seeking to fill this emptiness in their life with money and with buying the right things or getting the perfect grades or the test scores or the awards or the promotions or the scholarships or another degree or another new hobby. And when I say people trying to fill their lives with this stuff, I don't mean non-Christians. <laughs> Plenty of people who are Christians are still seeking to. And plenty of Christians myself included sometimes, are looking in the wrong places. Whatever it is, we are still journeying through our faith and we're trying to figure it out. We are searching for the answer. We're trying to find this something that we know is there. We can sense it. We can sense our desire to seek it out, to grope for it in the dark. We know that something is missing in our lives. We are searching for a God that feels unknown to us, just like the Athenians with the altar to the unknown God, just like the astrophysicists searching for ways to put dark matter facts on paper instead of just using gumball illustrations. We are searching. And Paul, Paul says, I know what you are looking for. I know that God. Paul says you are looking for the creator of the universe, the Lord of heaven and earth, the Lord that doesn't live in shrines built by human hands. You are looking for a God who is bigger than job promotions and salaries and technology. You are looking for a God who is bigger than social hierarchy and Instagram-worthy travel pictures of gelato. And you are looking for a God that is bigger than 401ks and triathlons and luxury clothing and the perfect style of parenting, whatever that is. You are looking for the God who is bigger than any shrine we make, whatever it is. 
We aren't fulfilled by those things, and deep in our heart, we know it, and we are looking for the God that is bigger than that. Paul preaches that this God we are seeking and the God that he knows, this God that gives life to all beings and then places us, each and every person. God places us on earth for the purpose of striving toward God, not anything more, not anything less. And Paul preaches that that God is nearby, close. In God, Paul quotes from some Greek poetry here. This is not Judeo-Christian thought. This is Greek poetry. In God, we live and move and have our being. We are the children of God. That's why I love this little mini-sermon of Paul's. He brings good news to everyone who is searching, whether it's the people in Athens or those of us sitting here today. The unknown God, the dark matter of our lives, the space that sometimes feels empty in us so we keep seeking something out in the world, something we know is there, but we can't quite see it and we can't quite explain it. Those answers to the big things of who am I and what am I supposed to do with my life Paul preaches the name. And ironically, Paul never even says the name, but Paul preaches a resurrected Jesus. Paul says that in Jesus, we can know that we are God's children. That is who we are. It is no longer unknown. And in Jesus, we know that God's love for us and our purpose is to seek relationship with God. That is what we are supposed to do. In Jesus, we know. We don't have to look anywhere else. We shouldn't look anywhere else. Good grades and great jobs and working out and college degrees and parenthood and self-improvement and sailing around the globe are all great things to pursue but they are not God in our lives. They are not spiritual fulfillment. Jesus is. When I look at the giant jar of black gumballs, thinking about how much of the universe that we don't know about and that we can't understand or name, I can't help but think about there's still a lot of God in our faith in Jesus that is a mystery also. And that's okay. But the good news as preached by Paul for us today is that while parts of God are still a mystery and some days more than others we are still seeking in our faith quest, our God is not nameless. Our God wants to be known by us and include us in God's family. Our God is Jesus Christ, present with us by the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen.